Let's Science is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. We live in a universe of scientific wonders. Every day, scientists are inching towards breakthroughs which can change our lives. We're playing our small part in sharing these wonders with you. That's why today is a fine day for science. So let's science. Recently, scientists have put together an amazing first picture of the supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which is the galaxy that we are living in. And yes, it's called Sagittarius A star. And it was um, came out on May the 12th. And these were taken by astronomers at the Event Horizon Telescope or the EHT. And it, this, yeah, the first ever picture of a Sagittarius A star. Now, this isn't the first time that a black hole has been photographed and imaged. This at the same time, do you remember a few years ago in 2019 that they released the first ever image of a supermassive black hole? And that was at the center of um, M87. So it was M87 star. Now, Compared to M87 black hole, Sagittarius A star is a thousand times less massive and M87 is actually 7 billion times the mass of the sun. Now, Sagittarius A being small is still huge because it's 4 million times the mass of our sun and it is 26 million kilometers in diameter. It's massive. That's why it's called massive. And it's located in the constellation Sagittarius when it's viewed from Earth. Now, theories of Sagittarius A star actually has a long history dating back to the 1930s, believe it or not. In the early 1930s, a scientist called Carl Jansky found a radio signal emitted from a location in the constellation Sagittarius. Actually, he was working for a telecommunication company. I was watching on YouTube yesterday and that wasn't the intention but he found this radio signal while he was trying to search for other maybe interferences for this telephone company and it was coming when he found this radio signal was directed towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The source was identified then in 1974 by astronomers Bruce Ballack and Robert L. Brown and they called it a radio center compact source. And that's when they named it Sagittarius A star. Brown liked the idea of adding the star as, you know, to distinguish it from the constellation Sagittarius. And the star is also a notation in physics, which represents an atom in exciting state. And, you know, he said that this discovery was exciting. So it was appropriate to add this little star with little asterisk up the top. In the 1980s, astronomers then proposed that this object is likely to be a black hole of an unimaginable size. Two teams of astronomers started tracking the motion of stars near the radio source, so not the source itself, but around the source, and they saw stars moving around the object at the speed, at one third the speed of light. It suggested that the center of the Mel- in the center of the Milky Way was a black hole four million times the mass of the sun. Then astronomers Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez later shared a Nobel Prize in physics for their work. Continuous work has been done over time. And then in 2018, they had conclusive evidence that the compact object Sagittarius A star was indeed a supermassive black hole. Astronomers using the European Southern Observatory, VLT, Very Large Telescope, observed emissions caused by magnetic interactions from hot gas clumps close to the black hole, moving at 30% the speed of light. And now we have the photographic evidence. So really, what is a supermassive black hole? It is the largest type of black hole. Typically, black holes are classes of objects that have undergone a gravitational collapse, like stellar mass black holes and intermediate black holes from when when stars run out of gas and cease nuclear fusion. They kind of there's a run out of gas and then they have a spaz attack and then they go like, Wah! and then they just collapse back down on themselves and become a really, really dense object. Now, it's not completely clear how supermassive black holes found in the center of galaxies are actually formed because there's no stars big enough. There are no stars the size of 
you know, the centre of a galaxy to create anything this size. So there are a couple of theories that maybe smaller black holes grow extremely large by swallowing up gases and dust. So they would have to eat a lot, like really, they would have to really be chewing up the dust. Or smaller black holes merging together to form much larger black holes. That's another theory. Maybe then they attract stars and they make a galaxy. I'm not sure. That's just me (laughs) theorizing. And then I heard another interesting theory that perhaps supermassive black holes are actually clumps of dark matter, which is another story all itself, but that's very interesting. So a black hole itself is a very dense object with a massive gravitational pull from which nothing can escape, not even light. It drags gas and dust orbiting around it. They're very hard to see because they don't emit light. Instead, they trap photons in a boundary called the event horizon and there's an accretion disk around the black hole. So that's all the dust and gas around it. So what does this photo show? So you can't photograph the black hole itself directly, obviously, because there is no light. The light is going into the black hole and getting squashed. But what astronomers have done is to use the Event Horizon Telescope to pick up radio frequencies of the material that swirls inwards into the black hole at speed of light it's heated up by friction and emits energy so the photo produced is the image of a bright orange halo around a black hole or a shadow they call it and the halo is a representation of the emissions the telescope had to pick up these emissions through clouds of dust and gas in the center of the galaxy so they pointed right there but there, you know, there's obviously some interference and that's why you can't really image it with a visible light telescope because there's so much around there. And so what they do is, and obviously if there's no light emitted, you're not going to pick it up. So the radio telescopes really help you to pick up these frequencies. Now, when you look at the image, it's orange. Now, orange is, what I learned is, is delegated to the radio frequencies of this kind and infrared and all of that. So if you see images from the James Webb telescope, it's red because it's taken in the infrared. So there's a bit more <laughs> side information for you. And also when you're seeing, you know, I think you've probably seen, well, have a look, but you'll see theoretical images of the black hole as well, where you see kind of a disk but then the disk folded over itself and that's because the particles of light kind of some of them skim across and some of them you know go around and then light is bent and bent this way and bent that way so they're not even sure which direction they're looking at the supermassive black hole from at the moment so it's it's yeah it's it's just mind-blowing the whole thing but super cool Now, the observations made to be able to capture data to construct the images of Sagittarius A and M87 star were actually made at the same time using the EHT. But as you might notice, MH87, MH, M87 star images came out a lot earlier and it was thought that perhaps that they would release the images of Sagittarius A star first because since, you know, it's, it's, our galaxy it's right in our galaxy but it's taken longer for the images of Sagittarius A star to be constructed because of a difference in size and behavior of the two black holes which is interesting in itself so while M87 star is much further away it's actually quite a lot larger like I mentioned than our supermassive black hole and it's been Taking images of Sagittarius A star, is, it's been equated to like take, trying to take a picture of a donut on the moon. That's how, how small it is. Um, how, yeah, so you can imagine. So dust and gas, so yeah, so other reasons are so dust and gas whirl around the black holes at the speed of light, which is the same for both. But however, it takes two weeks for matter to orbit M87 star since it is larger and so it's a lot easier to capture information and to you know so it's not whirling around as fast but in Sagittarius A star it only takes a matter of minutes for matter to orbit orbit around meaning the brightness and pattern are constantly changing and they said imagine like a puppy chasing its tail and trying to take a still photo of that or a ballerina imagine if she's turning around and you sped her up and you tried to take a photo of that it's just quite, it was quite difficult to 
get images. And also there's a couple of other different differences, like our star is dormant, so there's not as much light being emitted, there's not as much chewing up of gas and dust by our, our um, supermassive black hole whereas m87 star is really active and it's just chomping down whatever it can you know so there's a lot of emission coming out of there and i just saw i'd mention quickly how the the images were captured so the way the eht work is works is quite interesting it's actually made up of eight telescopes back then now there's actually 11 telescopes based in different countries around the world and over five nights in 2017, observations were made by each of the radio telescopes. And while Earth was rotating, the telescopes observed the same astronomical object for several hours. And putting all these telescopes together actually makes like a telescope the size of the Earth, right? So the James Webb telescope, as cool it is, as it is, it's only about 6.5 metres in diameter. Whereas if you add all these telescopes together, they're really huge. And you need it to capture such objects really so far away. So the data was then recorded by each telescope onto hard disks and time tagged by the atomic clocks. Now, what they actually had to do was physically take the discs as hand luggage onto aircraft and, and they were transported to processing centres where scientists used supercomputers to process all the information and produce the amazing images of the black holes. The processing time was equivalent to running 2,000 laptops at full speed for a whole year. <laughs> so um, you can imagine why it actually has taken so long to get such an image. And, you know, the image we've got is amazing. I mean, the fact that we can see it, I mean, if you have a look, you can see like a, a donut ring with three clumps. Now, this is just kind of what they were saying is it's more of an averaged out image. So because you can't actually catch <laughs> catch it still. So there's there's three like regions on there, but it could just be like one big region circling around and they capture it at different times. And you know, you, you'll notice that one of the regions is a lot brighter. So they're saying that that's the light coming towards you. You know, you can see the light coming towards you, whereas the other's going away. Now, what I'm excited about is way in the future when we've got even better technology and we'll be able to get an even better kind of representation or image. But for now, this is super, super amazing. Let's Science is brought to you by StarQuest Media and is a fortnightly podcast that brings you the scientific wonders of our universe from a distinctly Catholic point of view. For more from Caroline, Lindsay and friends, listen to the StarQuest show, Catholics of Oz. Find links from today's show at sqpn.com slash science and find the Catholics of Oz at sqpn.com slash Oz. Be sure to follow the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever you can find podcasts or on the SQPN YouTube channel. The generous donations of our patrons at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Let's Science and all the shows at StarQuest, which makes our nonprofit mission possible. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Join us next time for more scientific wonders. And thank you for listening to Let's Science on StarQuest.